hold on steady from fire long before she wrapped her scarlet arms around the hills there was a love this ancient I'm Reverend Elise Feltrin, and I welcome you as we gather on the traditional territory of the Penelicut peoples to worship and today commemorate the 96th anniversary of the United Church of Canada. And we are reminded that long before the United Church of Canada, long before the Penelicut peoples, long before anything we can remember, there was and still is and always will be an ancient love that surrounds us all. Our call to worship this morning. Our story of faith and ministry is colorful and vibrant. We herald our history with pride and delight. Yet, 
we also remember our failings with lament and sorrow. Our story of faith is certainly not perfect, but we keep trying. We have adapted to changing needs and ever-shifting demands, none more so than during this time of pandemic. We celebrate the many decades of learning, growing, and adapting. We pray that the Spirit will continue to guide and inspire us in the changes and adaptations we yet need to embrace celebrating 96 years as the ever-evolving United Church of Canada. Come, let us worship and praise God. Let us pray. Here we are, gracious God, gathered as your people on this 96th anniversary of the United Church of Canada. Here we are, joining generations who have worshipped in, shared the mission of, and cherished this denomination before us. Some of us know you through scripture and in exploring your word. Some of us understand you through a close relationship with Jesus, your son. Some of us discover you in the community we form together. Some of us find you as we serve others. Some of us know your presence as we seek justice and right relations in this world. Some of us discover you in the stillness of prayer and contemplation. Many ways to know you, many ways to serve you, many gifts you have given to each of us for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ. Together we are known as the United Church of Canada. Thank you, O oh God, for this gift. Amen.
with a foundation built on Jesus Christ, let us come before God seeking forgiveness for those ways in which we have neglected to be Christ-like in our thoughts and behavior. Our God is a God of forgiveness. Let us raise our confessions to the Divine Presence. Loving God, we come to you today with all the wrongs we have done, those we have done knowingly, those we have done in ignorance, those we should have done but did not. We have kept these transgressions to ourselves. In our silences and separation from you, we have felt the weight of our guilt. We have been as a dried up river, so we come to you now for refreshment and forgiveness. We acknowledge our failings and pray for your unfailing forgiveness that we may be reconciled to you and be refreshed by your mighty waters. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And this is the good news that Jesus came to share, my friends. Our God is a God of forgiveness. Let us be assured that God does not hold our sins against us. God is our rock and our hiding place. God is our deliverance in whom we rejoice always. Let us give thanks for this amazing grace. Amen. psalm today is from Voices United 860 and it's Psalm 138 and I, I invite you to respond with the refrain, we worship in your holy place and praise you for your truth and grace. I praise you, O God, with all my heart. Before the gods I will sing your praises. I bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name for your love and faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day that I called, you answered me and put new strength in my soul. We worship in your holy place and praise you for your truth and grace. All earth's rulers shall praise you when they hear the words of your mouth. They shall sing of your ways, O God, sing that your glory is great. For though you are high and you care for the lowly, 
As for the proud, you humble them from afar. We worship in your holy place and praise you for your truth and grace. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me. You stretch out your hand against my enemy's rage. Your powerful hand delivers me. You will fulfill your purpose for me. Your love, O oh God, is eternal. Do not leave unfinished the work of your hands. We worship in your holy place and praise you for your truth and grace. And our wisdom story is brought from 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. Paul writes, The scripture says, I spoke because I believed. In the same spirit of faith, we also speak because we believe. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus to life, will also raise us up with Jesus and take us together with you into his presence. All this for your sake, and as God's grace reaches more and more people, they will offer to the glory of God more prayers of thanksgiving. For this reason, we never become discouraged. Even though our physical being is gradually decaying, yet our spiritual being is renewed day after day. And this small and temporary trouble we suffer will bring us a tremendous and eternal glory, much greater than the trouble. For we fix our attention not on things that are seen, but on things that are unseen. What can be seen lasts only for a lifetime but what cannot be seen lasts forever. For we know that when this tent we live in, our body here on earth is torn down, God will have a house in heaven for us to live in, a home that God has made himself, which will last forever. May we find wisdom speaking to us through these ancient words. Amen. <clears throat> Despite the fact that the epistles were written first, many churches and preachers avoid or dismiss these letters scribed by Paul to the early church as irrelevant in our time and place. They are quite distinct from the later Gospels, which recount in a relatively unfolding narrative the life and ministry of Jesus, where we more easily find wisdom in his parables and we experience his direct teachings while journeying alongside the disciples. In contrast, Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, the Corinthians, the Ephesians, and the Colossians are specifically addressing specific issues within these specific churches. While good news can still be gleaned from these writings, we must remember that they are targeted at particular first century audiences surrounding particular first century circumstances. Unlike the smaller cities of Thessalonica, Philippi, and Ephesus, Corinth was a bustling metropolis, and it was the first large urban center where Paul brought his mission. Corinth was a thriving hub of commerce and education, deeply rooted in Greek culture. Many of its residents were wealthy merchants and refined scholars. As you, might, as you might imagine, this sophisticated setting was a challenging context for Paul to introduce his new religious ideals of personal and communal life based on service and self-sacrifice and grounded in a crucified Christ. And yet Paul managed to live and teach among the Corinthians for about a year and a half, establishing a church with members who were receptive to these ideas and accepting of his persuasive leadership. But the mission to which the Spirit calls Paul is a transient one, and he feels compelled to keep moving, keep spreading the word, keep planting new churches. So Paul eventually leaves Corinth for other shores. While he maintains a soft spot in his heart for this Corinthian congregation, a new leader is delegated, and Paul continues to provide long-distance support and encouragement through a number of pastoral letters. 
Members of the Corinthian church obviously corresponded in return, as there are many sections in Paul's letters that address their specific questions and direct concerns, ranging from sex and marriage to speaking in tongues. And here we stumble too on many passages that provoke modern day readers, with some of Paul's written answers having been used to legitimize slavery or justify the subordination of women within the church and the family. Definitely not good news here. As so often happens within organizations, internal conflicts began to arise within the congregation at Corinth, and tensions developed in their relationship with Paul. Some of his supporters argued that his teachings and authority were being undermined by their new leaders. Others proclaimed that they were now spiritually mature enough to make their own decisions and forge their own way forward without Paul. And so Paul, hearing all of this, ever faithful and ever patient, sits down to draft yet another letter, parts of which are compiled here together with recovered segments from elsewhere that he's written in this epistle which we have now come to call 2 Corinthians. With age and a maturing wisdom, Paul's theology has been deepening. And knowing he is addressing an educated audience, he chooses language and concepts to which they will relate as he attempts to repair their strained relationship. He reiterates the polarities and differences that would be familiar to the Greek audience who understood a distinct separation between body and mind and spirit. Paul speaks of our ongoing physical decay in contrast to our continued spiritual renewal, the tents that we live in, our earthly bodies, being torn down in favor of building eternal heavenly life. And he emphasizes the need to not focus on tangible things which are actually seen, but on the intangible and if infinite things which are not seen. Paul is inviting the listeners or the readers of his letters to envision God's healing and new life, not as some distant future promise, but actually entering in to their present painful circumstances. This is a word of hope that needs to be heard by the struggling, conflicted church in Corinth. And it's a word of hope that needs to be heard by all of us today. The news last week of the mass unmarked grave discovered in Kamloops continues to reverberate through the United Church of Canada and throughout this land that we call home. During our 96-year history, the United Church had a significant hand in supporting and operating Indian residential schools. Perhaps well-meaning church folks of the day intended to demonstrate God's inclusive love by educating what they viewed as deprived Native children. But we have known for some time now that these schools became centers of abuse and neglect. Remote and underfinanced, they did not attract the best teachers, resulting in second-rate leadership who were often unemployable elsewhere. With low self-esteem and a hunger for power and obviously questionable values, these deprived adults sought to fulfill their own egos and urges through mistreating the helpless children. Couple this with a national system whose strategy was to civilize the savages by obliterating their culture and identity and we see how ripe this situation was for tragedy. We now know that our society, including our United Church of Canada, both witnessed and participated as Indigenous children were abducted from their parents, forced to cut their hair, change their names and their manner of dress. They were forbidden from speaking their native language and prevented from seeing their families. After years of fearful living in squalid conditions with sparse nutrition and strict labor, 
often accompanied by physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Those who survived were graduated back to their reserves like empty husks with spirits extinguished and without any social skills. They remained detached from, even ashamed of, their traditional ways and spirituality. Many did not understand what family meant anymore. Many were unprepared to cope with healthy and loving relationships. Many turned to alcohol and drugs and sexual promiscuity in attempts to numb their painful memories. As subsequent generations were born, many Indigenous mothers didn't know how to properly raise their children, resulting in disproportionately high child welfare interventions. Distrustful teenagers schooled in violence and despair resulted in disproportionately high crime, incarceration, and suicide. Their childhood trauma was carried into adulthood and passed on to subsequent generations. As native wisdom is gradually reclaimed from shame and cautiously, though generously, shared, we learn from our Indigenous elders that every decision or action affects descendants for seven generations. The last residential school in Canada closed in 1996 the year my youngest daughter was born. This is still first generation. And the harmful legacy of the residential school system continues to impact Indigenous communities, brought to light yet again with the things we have seen in the past week. 215 young lives lost visually represented in many places by 215 empty pairs of shoes. While walking home from work this week, I also saw on the fence of Shimanus Elementary School 215 orange ribbons gently fluttering in the breeze, respectfully tied there by the compassionate teachers in honour of another 215 young students. These things seen hauntingly remind us of the things unseen that took place behind the closed doors of our residential schools, tangibly representing the intangible discrimination, racism, and hatred in which this national tragedy is rooted. We may think that this is all past history that we personally were not involved. We may proudly claim that as individuals, we honor and respect all peoples. But white settlers, such as myself, cannot deny that we have benefited from the colonial system that continues to provide us with privilege, status, and opportunity in this country, while indigenous peoples continue to suffer. In 1986, the United Church of Canada offered an apology for our role in the tragedy of residential schools, recognizing that there is yet much work to be done in repairing strained relationships. And if you've never read it before, this is your homework for today after the service. Google United Church Apology 1986 and do some reflecting on that document. In 2015, Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission submitted a report with 94 calls to action, including revising how Canadian schools teach history and how churches can offer space for raising awareness and healing about Indigenous issues. And this is another document that can be easily found and read online. There is much work yet to be done, seven generations of work. But taking hope from the ancient writings of Paul, we must envision God's healing and new life, not as some distant future promise, but actually entering into these present painful circumstances. 
The reality of Christ's resurrection, Paul argues, is not some disembodied, distant spirituality, but a future that can be claimed now with the promise of God's presence, God's grace, and God's mercy actively touching broken lives, damaged relationships, and suffering communities, bringing renewal out of pain and strife. Today, we are invited to ponder how our country, our church, and our own lives might be transformed by this promise so that we don't just put flags at half-mast and flutter ribbons in the breeze, but we somehow tangibly participate in the very real healing and reconciliation that is needed with all our relations. May God help us. Thanks be to God. Amen. As our pastoral prayer, I share a prayer written by moderator of the United Church, Richard Bott, for the students of Kamloops Residential School. Let us pray. O oh God, we are grieving. O oh God, we are shocked. O oh God, we are horrified. But God, if we truly listened, we can't be surprised. The elders and the communities had already told the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, told the governments and the world the stories of the children, dead and buried, unnoted by the settler systems, but never ever forgotten by their siblings, their parents, their communities. We grieve for the Indigenous children, taken from their homes and parents by the government, handed over to the responsibility of the Christian Church, the children who died under its care, never to be held by their families, never to be returned to their communities. Not only the 215 children of the Tekemlups, Tsekwepek, and other Indigenous communities along the West Coast and Interior, whose bodies have now been found on the grounds of the Kamloops Indian Residential School, but all of those children whose bodies have not yet been found, who died in any of the Indian residential schools. We grieve for the survivors of the Indian residential schools, the children who did come home but were changed by their experience, the children who grew up and have the trauma of remembering again what happened to them. Even as we give thanks for their families and communities, we hold the stories of the children who have kept searching, who keep searching. We grieve that that search is even necessary, that even one child was taken, that even one child died, that even one child's death went unnoted by the system. Help us to stop to sit in silence, to remember the names we do not know. May their spirits have peace and their bodies be brought home to their lands. And God, help us to take this grief, this shock, this horror, and turn it into right action action that works for right relations, action that works for healing and justice and hope. And please, God, don't let those of us who are settlers and descendants of settlers, newcomers to this land, let the horror, the shock, and the grief just be an outpouring of words or tears or ineffectual hand-wringing. Let this be a moment that changes a moment that transforms the brokenness that we might walk in right relations for the good of your children, for the good of your world, for the good of your church. Please, God. 
These things we pray in the name of the one who brought creation into being, in the name of Jesus, our teacher and friend, in the name of the Holy Spirit, whose wings spread across the sky. Amen and amen. It's difficult to say on this day that we're celebrating 96 years. But I do say as we look into the future and we listen to the next hymn, we can always look at the type of church that we care to build. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong.
Today we have a minute for mission that starts with a true or false question. The United Church of Canada was formed in 1925 in part, so the founding denominations, Methodist, Presbyterian, and Congregational, could combine their finances to do more mission work in Canada and around the world. If you guess true, you are right. From the very beginning, our United Church was formed out of a desire to come together and serve others like Jesus did. Through the Mission and Service Fund, we have been helping to save and transform lives, inspire meaning and purpose, and build a better world for 96 years. And today we are as committed as ever. Together we turn compassion into action every day. How? To put it simply, we help. In Canada, we help people in need by supporting homeless shelters, food banks, soup kitchens, and refugee programs. We reach out to young people on campuses and through camping. We care for people who are sick or at the end of life by supporting addiction, mental health, and counseling services and hospice care. Globally, we help people access clean water, food, and medical care. We support skills training and economic development. We help with peacemaking and sustainable agriculture efforts. We provide disaster relief and advocate for the rights of those who all too often don't get a say, like children and migrant workers and our Indigenous communities. We also support opportunities for people to grow spiritually in all kinds of ways. Locally, we subsidize theological schools and education retreat centers. We support events that promote spiritual development and personal reflection. We inspire new and innovative ministries and sustain communities of faith that are remote or in need. Globally, we support church organizations that work with theological schools, offering practical training in agriculture and health. It's a win-win. We trust that when people are in tune with their meaning and purpose, they will naturally want to change lives and make the world a better place for all. This is what happens through your mission and service dollars. They go a long way. Thank you for continuing to support the Mission and Service Fund and the Ministry of Shemanus United Church. Your support makes a world of difference. What can I do? Gracious God, for almost a century, people have shared their time, talents, and treasure with your United Church. May our gifts continue to multiply as they bring hope and transformation to a world so desperately still in need. Bless us with continued generosity to support your ongoing mission in this time and place, and bless our gifts that they may continue to grow and bring new life. We offer with praise and with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as we go forth this week, we go with heavy hearts and yet with hope in our hearts. And I send you forth in the name of the Holy One, whose word is truth, whose will is justice, whose wisdom is peace, and whose way is love indwell us by the Spirit, sustain us with grace, and send us on to bless this world moment by moment, neighbor by neighbor, prayer by prayer. Go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. And as our journey of faith for 96 years in the United Church of Canada continues, 
We are on a journey as pilgrims, and our final hymn is a compilation specially made for this 96th anniversary with clergy from across Canada singing together in a virtual choir, We Are Pilgrims, Voices United, number 595. I invite you to enjoy this final hymn and watch for any familiar faces. As we gather to celebrate 96 years of ministry that is closely entwined with the history of Canada itself, we do so acknowledging that we have been able to accomplish this project, this union on traditional lands of people who lived here long before any settlers showed up. The United Church was inaugurated on June 10, 1925 in Toronto, Ontario, when the Methodist Church, the Congregational Union of Canada, and 70% of the Presbyterian Church of Canada entered into a union. Also joining was a small General Council of Union Churches centered largely in Western Canada. It was the first union of churches in the world to cross historical denominational lines and received international acclaim. Each of the founding churches had a long history in Canada prior to 1925. The movement for church union began with a desire to coordinate ministry in the vast Canadian Northwest and for collaboration in overseas missions. Congregations in Indigenous communities from each of the original denominations were an important factor in the effort toward church union. The United Church of Canada continues to be a uniting church and has been enriched by several additional unions since 1925. In 1930, the Synod of the Wesleyan Methodist Church of Bermuda became part of the United Church of Canada's Maritime Conference. The Evangelical United Brethren Church became part of the United Church of Canada in 1968. In addition, various individual congregations from other Christian communions have become part of the United Church over the years. Today, the United Church ministers to over 2 million people through about 3,000 communities of faith or congregations. In April and May, ministry personnel from across the United Church of Canada joined together in song. Almost 70 singers sent in videos. Musicians from across the church and the Prince George Conservatory of Music created the accompaniment track. Together, we offer you this gift, from ministry personnel to the church that we love so much.